And welcome to another episode of Our Town. We have some very special guests in studio today. And of course, it's not your ordinary Our Town where we're hitting the streets, talking to community members or even members of different organizations. But today we are here in studio at uh, Mohawk TV, your local channel four on Paul's Cable. And we have um, representatives from Dewa Doni Zakta in studio today to discuss the organization and how things are going over there. And of course, we did receive some emails from our viewers asking about different things that are going on in the community related to Dewa. So of course, who would be best to answer some of those questions is their staff. So welcome to studio guys. Um, if you can just introduce yourselves, we'll start with Stephen. Good morning, Reagan. Uh, Steve, my name is Stephen Horn, Stephen O. Horn, O for Osirase. I'm the director of the Employment and Training Division at Dewa. Okay, what's going on, Ardu? Good morning. I'm Barbara McCumber. I'm the Director of Small Business Services. Okay. I'm Kyle DeLille. I'm the Director of Revenue Generation. Okay, so if you guys don't mind, just um, let our viewers know, what exactly are you responsible for in your department? Okay, um, employment and training. Uh, United States, to use a term which I like, actually I like better, it's called the workforce development. Essentially, it's a uh, training, uh, working with our, our labor force or our potential labor force, train them to get them the skills to enter into the labor market. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's it. And we do it uh, through a variety of, of uh, approaches and programs um, uh, from counseling, uh, getting people into the right training, um, academic upgrading, getting them the skills to enter into the right type of training, um, and then support uh, during that those training uh, times through uh, uh, follow-up as well as financial uh, mm -hmm. support uh, that is uh, tuition and uh, allowances during that uh, finally at the end of the, of the process if if it's still required we can then sometimes enter into uh, employability uh, programs employability measures uh, to help them get short-term experience to to get them exposure build up their CV and make uh, networks and, and contacts into the uh, to employers. So if you're dealing with um, an adult who wants to retrain themselves, <clears throat> say, in accounting, they would look for a school or would they would recommend something? Um, sometimes it, it can work uh, uh, both ways. Someone might have a, a firm idea of the school they want to go to mm -hmm. um, and the, the program they want to go to. Other time, times an individual might come in with only vague idea of what they want to do and we can provide a variety of tools and methods to help them uh, uh, make that choice to right. go to accounting. Do you do like testing of any sort to help pe some people find yeah. out what they're good at? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there's a, like I said, there's a variety of tools. We have some softwares, uh, employment readiness scale to see where the challenges are. They are where their challenges lie in terms of uh, uh, attaching themselves to the labor market. And it might not just be skills. Uh, there could be other other factors in, in th their, uh, in their way, mm -hmm. other obstacles in their way. And so we try to uh, address that with the individual and say, look, there's, you know, you, you, you don't have transportation or, or, or even other deeper issues such as uh, could be emotional anger uh, or other family situations, which would prevent them aside from just having the accounting skills. Right. Is there a cost to any of your services? Uh, for the most part, I would say no. Is there a cost? No. I mean, like there's a cost, there's a, there's a community cost. I mean, there's a big... It, let's say, for example, I came in and I wanted to do the test that helps me decide, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. what I want to do with my life. Is yeah. there a cost to that? No. Okay. No. So there's a cost to Devodoni Zakta, but yeah. not to the client? Yeah. yeah. There are, well, I should say, that's, that's why I'm hesitating. There is cost in certain instances. If you want to go to an accounting program mm -hmm. and that it's, it's a, a, a program that's offered at uh, the Nova Career Center, probably no cost to you. If you say, oh, I want to go to an accounting program at a private accounting school in Montreal, and I think this accounting school is better, mm -hmm. and, but the tuition varies greatly from uh, Nova Career Center, where it's, it's uh, subsidized by the MELS, um, Ministry of Education at Nova right. Career Center, and it would be a reasonable uh, tuition. Uh, so we would pay the tuition, we would pay you an allowance. On the other hand, if you wanted to go to the uh, private institution in Montreal, then uh, the, the tuition might go up to $10,000, $15,000. Mm -hmm. And that's where you would have to pay. 
Okay, the difference, or uh, yeah, you we would have, give so much we, the same as you would give. We give to so Nova much. Or, yeah, and okay. we have we have a scale, a sliding scale, and there's a cost share involved. And then you would make the decision. Well, that's how much it's going to cost me. Maybe I will go to Nova, or no, I I still want to go to the uh, Montreal program. Okay, we'll come back to more of that, Barbara. What is uh, your department responsible for? So Small Business Services is there to provide support to the business community, people that are already in business, people that are looking to go in into business, and people that are that might be in business and are looking to expand. Mm -hmm. So we have a variety of programs and services that will help them to, to meet their business goals. Okay. So what are some of the challenges that your department might face in any given, any given year, let's say? Um, well, there's a lot of challenges right now, especially with the economic climate. Mm -hmm. You can see that there aren't as many businesses opening and there are, you know, several businesses that have closed. Right. So I, I guess our biggest challenge is in terms of with our, we have a loan fund, is to try and get loans out there so that we'll be able to use the money, but also to help, to help new businesses start and also to, to help the businesses that are in business to stay in business. Mm -hmm. So we provide support, we provide aftercare if people are having problems, they might come into us and ask us for, for our assistance to help them going forward. Mm -hmm. So when you say aftercare, are you talking about accounting or? Whatever they might what need, that? it depends on the need of the individual clients. Some will come in and we do provide aftercare in terms of helping them set up their bookkeeping. We, could, we do it on, a, on simply accounting. Mm -hmm. So they'll bring us their statements and we'll prepare, we'll put it, all the information in, do the data entry and provide statements and if they want us to go over those statements with them and help them understand what it's telling them we'll do that mm -hmm. so we have a lot of clients like that we have others that will just come in and ask for other information on for example on on market you know what to do how to increase their business or mm -hmm. things like that okay how many businesses would you say in to your knowledge open every year in Kahnawake? Small businesses small businesses that open we actually we actually track that and that's published in our annual report this past year. I'm trying to remember, I don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but we track the number of micro businesses, small, medium, and large. Mm -hmm. So there's been about in the past year, maybe around 10. Okay. If you want to know for sure, we'll have to look at that statement. Okay, it's no problem. Yeah. I just wanted an average. But also keeping in mind that there's other businesses that have closed. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to look at the total amount of businesses of support that we provide to the community or businesses that come into our office that are published in our in our business directory there's approximately there's an average of 280 so the new ones that open and the ones that close where we try and it's kind of maintained mm -hmm. at that amount over the years what type of businesses are opening in the community mostly they're micro businesses it's one person and mm -hmm. it's mostly we have some you know people providing services or products, convenience stores, it's all mostly mom and pops right now. Okay. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Now, Kyle, tell me, what are you responsible for in your department and what do you do? Like, what is your department about? Well, Revenue Generation is specifically, we oversee the development, implementation, and management of community-owned businesses. And the primary purpose of doing the community-owned businesses is to create revenue for the community mm -hmm. as well as to create jobs. So okay. right now, it's uh, just myself and Amy Rice. Uh, and our, my executive assistant, uh, Marissa LeBlanc, is part of the department. Uh, so we're not uh, funded by the provincial or federal government. Basically, what we use are the profits that we generated from some of our other businesses, such as the Ganawaga Office Complex, uh, okay, from yeah. Continent, and the Ganawaga uh, Business Complex. Mm -hmm. So those profits help uh, co basically cover the cost of our department or okay. our division. Okay, so when you talk about revenue generation, um, you're looking at what type of industry that could be developed in Ganawage for, well, for the mass? It, or? it could be the industry. I mean, it's really to see what type of business makes sense that, that could be okay. located in Ganawage that um, may not necessarily, usually they're on the larger scale because usually the individual business owner, it's too large, the capital requirements, how much money they would need to start the business is too large. Right. Um, so basically that's why we would look at it. Uh, so, so it's usually the larger type of projects and we try to look at uh, the growth industries. Um, so that's why, we, like for the wind farm, for example, we know there's always going to be demand for, for energy. For a while there, we were also looking at healthcare because there's an increase in demand for, for health, especially with an aging population, uh, with the baby boomers. Uh, but it just turns out because of the legislat 
legislation currently in Quebec, it's very difficult to do any type of private type of health service or healthcare business right now. Right. So we kind of dropped that off to the side for now until uh, it opens up a bit more in the future. Uh, and we're also looking, as I said, for the intermodal. So looking to see what are the benefits or what's going to walk as competitive advantage. And really what our competitive advantage right now is our location. Mm -hmm. So being on the Seaway, being so close to the market of uh, Montreal and really looking at the larger market of uh, within six hours of Ganawaga, you have New York City, you have Boston, uh, mm -hmm. you have Albany, you have uh, Toronto, Ottawa, Quebec City. So you have all these larger areas, uh, which is a key um, area that for, for businesses, you know, like Fortune 500, for marketing, I mean, you have the Walmarts that are looking mm -hmm. to locate in these areas. And so what advantage do we have? We're located near an airport. We have the seaway right there. We have rail. We have the major highway, especially with Highway 30. What advantage can Gunawage, well, can we take from that? So that's why right now we're also looking at the intermodal project. Uh, that's right now that's one of the biggest growth industries right now is the transportation of being mm -hmm. able to transport the goods uh, from overseas to the, to the market and then distributing it throughout throughout that market. So, uh, you know, using a Walmart distribution center, for example, having it located here, the shipments come in, whether it's from, from the seaway or from rail, goes into the, the warehousing, and then from there it gets distributed to La Salle, the one in Chattagui, the one in St. Coston, and, you know, across Quebec. Right. So those okay. are basically, we're trying to identify those industries and how do we, how can Gunawagi take advantage of those? Very challenging, I'm sure. And um, we're going to take a quick commercial break. So don't go away. We'll be right back with our town here on Mohawk TV Channel 4. This program has been brought to you by Get and Go, a proud sponsor of Mohawk TV programming. And welcome back to the program. We're going to just jump right back in. If you just started tuning in right now, we have special guests in studio today from Dewadoni Zakta to answer some questions about this unique organization in Gahnawage. So Kyle, back to you just really quickly is, um, what do you find is the most challenging area in your department, given the fact that um, Gahnawage seems to be very, um, touch and go, if you will, when presented with any economic development idea? Well, I guess that the, one of the major challenges is to, well, as, as you mentioned, the mindset of Kahnawake in general is, you know, not, not necessarily pro-development, uh, you know, it's not everyone's like that, but I think that mindset just comes from, from our past of, you know, especially for the past hundred years where iron work was the major, uh, revenue generator for the community with a lot of the men going out uh, all across North America to work. So they didn't really require any development here other than the small businesses, the stores and uh, what have you in the public sector required here. So, you know, it was almost like a suburb mm -hmm. where you know, all the development uh, or all the work took place outside and the money came back in. Uh, then we started to see that bitter shift, especially with the tobacco industry and with the decline uh, in the early 1980s of the iron working industry. And the increase of tobacco and uh, the manufacturing and retail, so the development starting uh, having to locate right in Kahnawake. And it also ties into, we've seen the change in mindset as well of uh, a lot of Kahnawake Rono that don't want to work outside of mm -hmm. uh, primarily for two reasons, with the taxation and the uh, French language requirements. Um, but even that's changing because a lot of the, especially the retail businesses um, or the other type of services such as the poker houses require their primary customers are French Mm -hmm. And so they are now starting to require French language in, in Kahnawake. So, you know, uh, overall that's been what Kahnawake has been used to over, over the past hundred years and a lot of development. And really, if we want to have the jobs here in Kahnawake, we're going to have to do some, some form of development. Um, and not everybody will necessarily like that or you don't want to see a certain type of development. Um, so we're, we're trying to to look at uh, where, where we can develop, where it has the least impact, at mm -hmm. least visually on, on the community. Uh, there's not a lot, of, a lot of residential areas around there or, or anything else like that. So, mm -hmm. and, and try to, I guess what we're looking at, especially over the, the next year or two, is really kind of educate 
uh, the community in general on, you know, where's the economy going in the 21st century? You mm -hmm. know, this isn't the, the 20th century economy anymore. It's not the 21st knowledge-based uh, economy and what kind of jobs can we reali realistically expect in the future? Uh, as I said, during the 1980s, that's when the uh, North American market really switched from uh, the industrial manufacturing type economy to a knowledge-based economy and services-based and consumption economy. And uh, that's why we saw the decline of iron workers. The U.S. had already completed, you know, from, since 1850 to 1980, done all the manuf built all the factories, built mm -hmm. all their infrastructure, built all the ports, and that's why we saw the big boom uh, in ironwork during those periods. And since you know around 1982, 1983, they switched, and the jobs have generally declined in the ironworking industry. There'll always right, be yeah. a need for ironworkers. There's still going to need to build. You Just know, not as large, some, right? Though, yeah. You know, they're still going to need to maintain the infrastructure and build the factories and. Mm -hmm. and what have you, but uh, it won't be in, like it was where, that we were used to back in the 50s and 60s, 70s. Um, so once again, I'm trying to show the community over the next 10 years, where are the growth industries? Where are the jobs going to be? And you know, uh, the days of having a high school diploma and being able to get a job they are pretty much long gone. 70% uh, of the jobs over the next 10 years are going to require <coughs> at least a three-year technical degree. You know, at least another 20, 25 percent of those jobs are going to require bachelor's or above degrees. You know, right. so a lot of the unskilled labor jobs are going to be basically automated, or will be people with college degrees. Right now, all the people graduating from uh, university just this year, in May of 2013, it's projected 50 percent of them will end up in jobs that don't require a college degree. And out of those, 38 percent will end up in jobs that don't even require a high school diploma. Why is that, though? It's because they really haven't studied in the right fields. Right now, okay. there's only four degrees that require, uh, or four degrees that guarantee you a job, and that's in science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and math. That's why they, they call it the STEM degrees. Those are the only ones that guarantee you. Uh, the other degrees increase the likelihood of getting a job, but it is not a guarantee. Which are? Well, if you're looking at uh, any type of liberal arts degree, or even a business degree, mm -hmm. really, there's no guarantee that you're gonna, it increases the likelihood you get a job, but it's not a guarantee anymore. Mm -hmm. So Now, do you guys, do your departments bleed into one another in terms of sharing of information or, I mean, I would imagine that maybe uh, small business services and employment and training might do a lot of work together? I don't know, I'm just assuming. Well, we're starting to, I, I think we, we, in the past, we kind of work in, in our own little silos. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, recently we've started to realize the impact of really once the uh, tobacco industry started going down because when right. said, although the iron working industry went down that kind of got picked up by tobacco so we always had a lot of jobs and people had money and the economy was going the local economy was doing quite well mm -hmm. and now we're starting to see a bit of a decline in that area <clears throat> and so now we, we realize okay we not only do we have to start working more closely amongst the three of us but amongst all the organizations as well so uh, recently we started uh, working on the social policy with all the other organizations mm -hmm. so looking at maybe we need to be not working all in our silos from an institutional perspective. So we should be working with KSCS to identify those children before they even go into university. Are there some social issues that need, there needs to be an intervention early on to ensure that they succeed? Mm -hmm. As well as um, talking with the parents as well and uh, you know, showing them, to getting them to push the kids to go into the education, make them realize you have to, as, as I mentioned earlier with the statistics, where the jobs are gonna be and they're gonna require these type of degrees. And so working with the education center as well, and, and probably even the step-by-step uh, -step in, in uh, the daycares, because there's a big issue right now of there not being enough spots, daycare mm -hmm. spots. Right now there's approximately 367 uh, children in the zero to four age group, and yet there's only enough daycare spots for, for all half of them. Yeah. You know, so that, that's an issue right there. And then we can see that on the social assistance side that we have almost 30% of females between the ages of 20 to 29 are on social assistance. So is that causing they can't basically put their child in daycare, so they have to stay at home, go on to social assistance, mm -hmm. and can't work. It's a good so, point. So it's an issue of us having to work more closely together amongst within the Wadoon Zakta itself, mm -hmm. but also having to work with the other institutions in Gunawaga. And you know, when you talk about social plan or social issues, if you look at um, the the community health plan, I don't know if, if you're, um, informed about that but in terms of community services and the work that they do and how this all interrelates to each other um, how are the organizations getting on board with each other and I think that's important for the community to, to understand that 
maybe before, like you said, everybody just kind of worked, you know, independently of each other. But now, maybe in this day and age, those same uh, policies can't apply to a small community that's trying to break out of that same cycle of, of some of the social issues that we deal with. And even in economic development, I'm sure that each of you have your own um, challenges within your department. Mm -hmm. I guess just maybe I can interject uh, uh, further to what Kyle has outlined and I guess and what you're talking about the health and working in silos and uh, you know uh, with Unizakta we've conducted um, household surveys um, every about every five years and recently we did one in 2011 and and all that information that that has just been now analyzed and, and we're starting to see results and uh, it's kind of like a, a, a real uh, slap in the face or a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. The results we're seeing, in, in, um, from that the data that we we've seen in terms of uh, uh, increase in social problems, increase in social assistance, mm -hmm. um, decrease in uh, French proficiency rates. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things Kyle touched upon, and and that that was elaborated on. Uh, like you said, we're starting to to work with other agencies in the community and everyone's realizing that that what we're doing now is not working sufficiently uh it was someone mentioned at the meeting that if we got a, a report card on the services and the fact that it's happening in the community we we might be getting an f because of the unemployment rate of the, the future prospects of the youth uh health et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, uh, and so it's like saying, you know, we really have to, to uh, start working together and change uh, what we're doing. Okay. I, I want to talk more about that, but we're going to take a quick commercial break. Don't go away. You're watching Our Town. This program has been brought to you by Get and Go a proud sponsor of Mohawk TV programming. And welcome back to the program. Now, before we head uh, over to break, we were discussing um, some of the social issues that we deal with in Ganawage and also how economic development is impacted now you wouldn't necessarily think that those two went hand in hand but in this day and age it seems like everything's connected at this point and you were discussing about the household survey which i found really interesting about um, when you made reference to having a report card but did you ever expect or any of you ever expect that in your job you would you would deal with any of these issues like the social impact like in terms of administration of business and economic development in the community? Well, from, from the um, employment and training, for sure, right away, it was very obvious mm -hmm. that we, with the clients we see uh, come in at uh, various levels. Some are very prepared and some are very unprepared. And the unpreparedness is, is uh, often related to social ills. Mm -hmm. So yes, for sure. And, and economic development, that's the nature of the beast. It's just not simply uh, skill development or going back to school. It's, it's simply not business development, it's part of the community. It's an overall, it's a economic development. To have a strong economy, you need all parts of your community working. Mm -hmm. For sure. I mean, Barbara, how important are small businesses in the community? Well, I think small business is very important because that's a big, uh, a big sector of, of the economy. I, I just wanted to tap on to one issue when you discussed earlier about working in silos. And one of the things that we do at Dewa is every year we have strategic planning and I think that, and the planning is, is very thorough. We do a, a three-year plan and this year we did the same thing and we had a lot of input from council chiefs and other stakeholders in the community whereby we take a look, at, we do an environmental assessment and we do a SWOT assessment and we take a look at what's going around us so that when mm -hmm. we're planning our programs and services and, and businesses going forward, we're not doing it in a, a I can't think of the word, vacuum. in a vacuum, yeah. so to speak. So we are aware of what's going on and we get, we get good input. Okay. So looking forward, we, you know, we, we're always cognitive of what's going on around us, whether local and also external mm -hmm. factors that, that are happening. I think about one of the primary issues that we have is a lot of the data, like I said, we only get it every five years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most governments get their unemployment data on a monthly basis. 
you know, or, or due to our census or, or whatever, right. uh, you know, much more frequently. We only have five years, so like we do our strategic plan now, the data is already two years old. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so we know as of 2011, the unemployment rate in Kahnawake was 11.4% approximately. What is it today? Mm -hmm. you know, Do you think it's higher? Or? I think it is, but I, I can't back that up necessarily. Right. I just think that since 2011 to till now, we've seen maybe, uh, I mean, in 2011 at that point, uh, we were projecting the tobacco industry to increase whereas over the past couple of years, it looks like it's more declined than, than, than increased. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as well in 2011, 23.4% uh, of the youth were unemployed. So that, that's an even more uh, disturbing number. And has that increased, has that decreased over the past two years? Uh, we don't know. So that's one of the downfalls of the strategic plan, of not being able to do the household survey mm -hmm. on, a, on a, at least on an annual basis. You know, or, or even doing the unemployment, getting, getting calling people randomly uh, once a month to find out are you working or not, or full time or part time. Right. Just simple questions like that, just so we can figure out what's going on in the community, uh, what do we need to do, where do we need to focus our energies on? Because when I say in the past, I mean even in you know the corporate world, three to five year strategic plans were, were the the norm. And today, the economy is changing so fast, we have no idea what's even going to happen next week. Uh, a lot of them are getting rid of the three to five because it's, you know, one year is now considered a long-term mm -hmm. uh, strategic plan. And, you know, something could happen tomorrow that completely changes, changes our outlook, even locally. Right. Uh, and so we have to be more, more aware of what's, what's going on and, and having, you know, talking to people and seeing what they're saying, uh, talking to, you know, people in various industries, are you out of work, are you in work, and, and trying to get more anecdotal information than hard statistical mm -hmm. information until we can do it uh, you know that next time frame five years down the road right i mean they definitely the economy's changed i mean i know as a small business owner i've seen a lot of trends throughout the years and a lot of different challenges that we've experienced here at moac tv but do you think in any of your professional opinions that gunawage the people here in the community are aware of our location so to speak and and how we could be so much more economically developed that's just a personal opinion. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, as a journalist and also as a community member who has owned small businesses that, you know, when I see the potential, sometimes I feel that, you know, we're not, we're not nearly as advanced as we should be. I, I think to an extent we are and to, to others we're not. Uh, I, I mean, it's obviously before we, as uh, I'm talking about the iron workers who use, and those guys that still do iron work and, and women that still do iron working now, still travel all over the place to, to do work. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to see it a lot in the, the past because once again, that's how our economy was. The iron workers come back, the small businesses cater to them. Mm -hmm. And now trying to switch the mindset to, we have, you know, just under Mercy Bridge, 80,000, or maybe even more than that now, 80,000 people coming through the community on a daily basis and right. how to target them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have some businesses, the tobacco industry obviously targets that, that sector, the poker houses, um, and, so, and some of the retailers that are located on the highway there. But what are other advantages do we have that we can uh, take advantage of? Um, is it, I mean, personally, my personal opinion, I, I think maybe 1990 had something to do with it, the mindset of, you know, once that happened and we didn't really want as a community, anything to do with the outside. I mean, I know a lot mm. of people never went, to, didn't go to Shadigi or outside for many years. And uh, so what, did that help change our mindset to say, you know, we're, we're not really going to deal with the outside and we're just going to be more insular and, and kind of live on our island and right. not worry about anybody else. Uh, in my opinion, I think that that might have had an impact on that. But I think there, there is a lot more opportunity for Kahnawake to uh, take advantage of economically, you know, and, and it shouldn't just once again be David and Zakta. It shouldn't be revenue generation to be the one to to do that. I mean, we have some great entrepreneurs in this community that that um, you know could probably see that opportunity and, and take advantage of it. So, what if somebody had like a really great idea for a certain area in the community, which is obviously common land or publicly held, um, but it was a you know, a project that was on a grander scale, would your department be the one to contact? Not necessarily. Uh, it, okay. it depends. Um, we, we've already identified the industries that we want to invest in. If it's a good opportunity, uh, if it's in an industry, a specific industry that we've identified that we want to invest in, 
Mm -hmm. um, we may look at it, um, but myself, I believe as much as possible it should be the individual business owner. Mm -hmm. it, it'd be much more beneficial to, uh, to that person that comes up with this idea, well, let's work with small business services and uh, anybody else and find you some investors. Maybe we okay. can invest a portion, but we won't run the project and okay. help that person succeed as a business person so, rather than just Debo Doni Zakta okay. having to handle all these large projects. So. Right. So then it would go over to Barbara's uh, area. So then what? If that person decided they could come in and, and see what services and programs we have available. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we have grants and we have loans. Our newest program that we have, I don't know if you're aware, we have released the information, is the, it's an equity fund contribution. Mm -hmm. It's called the Debo Doni Zakta business contribution fund and mm -hmm. that's formerly the program that was offered by Aboriginal Business Canada. Right. Is so that with Ron Murray? Ron Murray yeah, is the former fantastic. employee that worked for them for 18 years. He mm -hmm. now works for us and he's um, he's the person that's that they would go to see to get that information. Mm -hmm. So between that program with our loan fund we have some smaller programs for marketing. Mm -hmm. We have our professional services um, we have the Business Assistance Fund, which we're also looking at modifying, making some changes this year mm -hmm. to maybe more meet the demand of the business community now as opposed to the way it was 10 years ago. Right. Um, so anybody with that type of business idea on a grander scale, there, there is resources available and I would encourage them to come into the office and the first thing would be to meet with Ron because for those people as an individual starting a business, they would have access of up to $99,999, but there's criteria, but the best thing is right. come in, see Ron, get all the information. And then we also have the business services officers that would work along with the, biz the business person and Ron to make sure that they're able to, to get their project going. Okay. I know a couple of years ago, um, we were looking at developing the common lens and some of the the issues that community members had was that there was no policy that was set in place to access those those lands, especially the ones that run along the highways because some businesses will do better with more traffic flow. Well, I believe all businesses will do better with more traffic mm -hmm. flow, but specifically ones that need a lot of traffic. So um, how can community members access land that belongs to Ganawage, that is governed by the Mohawk Council's policies. Is there something in place that David Donizakta has developed? Because I know that a couple of years ago there was talk of this and I just don't know where what happened. There was a, a land use policy that, okay. uh, a land use committee that was working on developing a policy. Now that goes back to I can't even remember how long. I used to be on that committee. It's got to be at least five years ago. We have not met. So we had we had a draft policy. And at the time, um, Heather Jacobs White was working there. And it got to a certain level. And then it kind of mm -hmm. dropped off the table. But I, right now, I've had a couple of business people with ideas that have come in to see me. And what I've done is we've directed them back to council because right now okay. with the lack of a pol uh, policy mm -hmm. um, and in speaking with, um, I believe it was Carol Martin at their lands, because there wasn't a formal process, what they had to do was write a formal letter, letter and bring it to the council chief that's working, working on that portfolio. So that's what okay. we had told them to do. And for now, that's the process. So okay. uh, as far as I know, I believe there are two people that have gone to council, they haven't come back to us to say whether they've gotten a response or not, but hopefully... Yeah, based on a, any land use policy, that's council. Yeah. Zakta has no authority to lease out lands to, to businesses, right. especially the, the common lands. Yeah. So they have to go through the lands unit. And yeah. from what I've heard, they're supposed to be resurrecting yeah, that, reinstating that, it, that, I guess, that yeah. policy that's a good or, thing. or mm -hmm. that committee. Business so. and politics never too far behind one another. <laughs> So don't go away. We're going to come back with the final segment of our show. Stay tuned. You're watching Our Town here on Local Channel 4. This program has been brought to you by Get and Go, a proud sponsor of Mohawk TV programming.
and welcome back to the program you're watching our town and if you're tuning in now you're almost at the end of the program so just wait a few minutes and it's going to start back over um, we're here with David Onizakta today discussing the organization and taking a look at economic development in the community and how things have changed and what are some of the challenges that we face in Gatnawage today so let's talk to the experts um, Stephen what would you say what has come out of ENT over the past couple of years that you've seen as a big change uh, you know since maybe you first started at Dewa Donizakta several years ago what has been a big change yeah what has your department done like in terms of on a grander scale because I mean the day-to-day -day things are one thing but yeah, yeah yeah I guess recently we've um, like I said in addition to the core counseling and 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 trying to get people in the right programs and and supporting people uh, in their training measures and preparing in academic. Uh, but what we've noticed, again, is attachment to the, uh, to the labor market is a, is a challenge. And that, that's relevant to the, uh, how strong the economy is. Also, how much the, uh, I guess, uh, individuals, once they graduate from the, the, the various programs, from the accounting program, from the welding program, from the carpentry program, et cetera, mm -hmm how much they are determined to attach themselves, to go out and find a job. And, and again, we're, we're we talked about earlier, Kyle talked about, uh, uh, and when you asked a question about the community and uh, its approach to economic development, and he, he mentioned like we're an island, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're an island, and, and, and how much people want to go off that island? And that's a real challenge, I think. Uh, uh, a lot of people want to improve their lives, they want to take the training, but the final step of going out and, and leaving the island is, uh, is challenging. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I guess that's one of the changes we've recognized and we're, we're trying to develop programming to address that. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 now you mean somebody who's gone to school in, in whatever trade and then to go and look for employment out of yeah, Kahnawake. Yeah. And, and language, again, we touched earlier on in our conversation about French language is a real challenge, an obstacle. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we're on that island, and it, if you're going to leave that island, French is pretty much a requirement today. You know, we see that filter down into the community on a grand scale in terms of um, heritage, language, and culture, and the importance that we place as Oguahume people mm -hmm. on keeping the language alive, people knowing their identity and things like that. And how, you know, as a community, do we get over that non-acceptance of the French language, knowing how important it is now and for the future, mm. without losing ourselves? I, I, I think that uh, we were there. Uh, if you go back 100 years ago, we had that strong culture, strong language, mm -hmm. and a stronger relationship with, uh, French, uh, with the French communities. Mm -hmm. And that changed out of economic necessity because of iron work and the, uh, to start to travel uh, great distances and picking up the English language. And maybe because of economic necessity, that's gonna go back that way. Mm -hmm. He just stole what I was gonna say anyway, so. Yeah, but it was basically based on, we were a French, basically a French and Mohawk speaking community, mm -hmm. you know, back in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And because of the iron work and going out to the US and having to speak English to get the jobs, we changed then and, you know, right. may, maybe now that will change us not necessarily where we're going to drop English and become a strictly francophone uh, mm -hmm. community, but realizing that, yes, we do need to speak French to, to get the jobs that, that are required. And, uh, you know, as Steve was saying, that the issue is being on that island. Just this morning, I looked up, I just were at workopolis.com and looked at Montreal job postings, and there was 2,400 and something jobs being posted right now, just today in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of jobs out there. There's also a lot of jobs in Kahnawake that are currently not filled by people from Kahnawake. So we had, mm -hmm. uh, in 2011, uh, the survey, we had approximately 3,422 jobs, uh, all jobs, in Kahnawake. And out of that, almost 1,000 of them were held by non you know, and, and wow. Almost 60% of that was in unskilled labor type jobs, uh, and mainly like in the poker houses, maybe in the, some of the tobacco manufacturing, uh, in some of the cigarette stores, uh, what have you. Mm -hmm. So there were the jobs there, but the main issue was, once again, French language. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, and uh, some of the big uh, accomplishments that I think, in, in my opinion, that I think Steve's department has done over the past couple of years was implementing um, their CBS program. Mm -hmm. 
and, and the mm -hmm. in introduction to construction trades program mm -hmm. and as well uh, a major one which I always use as a, as a great way to do economic development was the strategic health careers where uh, right, employment yeah. and training worked with the education center and John Abbott and Champlain College and KMHC or the Kateri Memorial Hospital you know the ones that are actually going to have the jobs to ensure that the curriculum that they uh, the school's curriculum met what their needs were mm -hmm. that ENT and it uh, I helped identify and made sure that the people coming in for those jobs had the basic skills and had the, uh, got the re uh, upgraded skills requirements as needed, went with the education center to the schools, and now they're guaranteed those jobs at the end. Right. So I think that's kind of the model, and as I've said before in, in other presentations, I think that's the model from the future that Deva Donizakta needs to follow when we're doing economic development, working more with those employers at the end and, mm -hmm. uh, and making, because they're the ones that have the jobs versus uh, just anyone that comes in training, I want to take this. Okay, well, is there an employer at the end there? Mm -hmm. You know, to, to make sure that they, they're, they're just not going through the training and becoming unemployed at the end. So, right. So you've been doing a good job. So. <laughs> <laughs> you <Fair> saved so. <laughs> you. <laughs> no, but um, to build on that, I think one of the programs that I've seen come out of David Donizakta this year was with, I think you just mentioned it, the CBS. Is that the career building, building skill book yeah. where you're targeting the younger generation right is yeah. that angie that would run that because we did invite her but you know do the limited space yeah. and time obviously yeah yeah Kara, uh, angie has her hand and, and uh, uh cara uh paul as well okay uh, as the coordinator of that program who's on maternity leave right now okay do you want to talk just really quickly on behalf of that youth uh development within david doni zakta in terms of some of the things that you guys have been doing over there and in her area? Uh, well, we have, right now we're running the uh, Summer Student Employment Program. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a great, solid program which we've uh, run every year and, mm -hmm. and, and we want to expand that program. It's so valuable. The, uh, the students uh, learn skills that are gonna, they will take with them the rest of their lives. Right. And, uh, and we've actually uh, did some research uh, several years ago which shows uh, students who go through that program are the less likely to to uh, are more likely to finish their, their studies and less likely to go on uh, social assistance. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a proven program. I know so that's because so they're getting hands-on yeah, experience yeah, yeah. that shows them yeah, what yeah. they're in for. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, we have that. We have the CBS program, which Kyle uh, uh, spoke about. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a Skills Link program. It's it's for kind of like the summer student program, but this is directed for students who are not in an uh, in uh, educational environment right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're going to move on just to some questions that I know that the community community has been asking, maybe in general, and you guys probably got some at the, the community meeting, which we didn't discuss. I wanted to know how that presentation went, and was there anything that really stood out for any of you in terms of the community coming forward and asking questions after you all finished presenting. Well, since they both looked at me, I guess I'll answer. <laughs> uh, generally, I think the presentation went very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the community was, the members that were there were appreciative of getting the information um, mm -hmm. that we presented on basically covering what ENT provides, what SBS provides, and what projects we, uh, we were looking at. Um, and generally, you know, uh, majority of the questions were, were just for clarifications and uh, there wasn't really any, any controversy there. So, mm -hmm. um, so in general, it was, I thought it went overall very, very well. Right. The presentation. So everyone just gave an update of their department, basically, you know, what you've been up to and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Anything reoccurring that maybe comes up over and over again throughout the years that anyone wants to touch on? Could you be more specific? <laughs> well, just in general, I know one thing um, is like when we talk about economic development here in Kahnawake, I know that there's always a strong uh, backdrop to projects that are culturally acceptable in the community. And I would imagine that's quite difficult and challenging on your end. Um, but, you know, there's the casino was widely criticized in terms of not being in line with, you know, some of the belief system in the community. And that's neither here nor there, it depends on what side of the fence that you fall. I'm just using it as an example. But do you find yourselves presented with those challenges um, in terms of trying to find projects that are, that you feel will have a better chance of surviving in the community once presented? Well, yeah, obviously when, when we start a project, I mean, that's always our first, uh, well, one, one of the first questions, first of all, does it make business sense? To, mm -hmm. to do it, is it actually going to, to make money and be financially 
uh, feasible? Mm -hmm. And secondly, will the community, what's the likelihood of community acceptance? You know, so if we were to, uh, I can't even think off the bat of, uh, say you're to bring in some type of factory that uh, was known to pollute a lot and a lot of noise, noise pollution as well, we knew the community won't accept that. Mm -hmm. And we're not even going to bother with that. Um, but generally, we look at those, and that's why we specifically looked at the, the energy, everybody requires energy, the health, uh, health industry, uh, the transportation industry. That's why we're kind of focusing on those ones that we believe. Uh, and we've actually conducted in our household survey, asked people questions on what, what are their concerns on projects and how, how they would rate them. You know, and being environmentally friendly was, was one of the top ones. Mm -hmm. uh, creating jobs was another one. So we try to make sure that when we're looking at a project, or even a potential project, does it meet these? Do, do we think the community will accept it? And if we don't think it will, or it'll be a real uphill battle, mm -hmm. then the likelihood of us going forward with it are, you know, greatly reduced. We're probably not going to go forward with it. Right. Um, in your opinion, and I just want to ask you specific to the, the department that you're working in, but um, Barbara, for example, what small businesses do you think people should be looking at getting into? Mm. <laughs> that, that's something that... And that's like putting you on the yeah, spot. Yeah, really putting me on the yeah. spot. And I, and I, you know, I think the answer there is for anyone that's looking at going into a business, we offer an entre entrepreneurship training program every September. Yep. And that'll provide the basis for them with which to do their research on their idea so that they're going to find out firsthand by doing the work, doing their research and putting all the numbers together that's required in the plan, looking mm -hmm. at their market and doing all their homework so that at the end when they have that plan, mind you working with their BSO and working right. with the instructor of the course, but by doing that themselves, they're going to be vested in it and if they have to put in their money, they're going to really look at it and once, they're, once it's all said and done, they're going to know on paper whether or not they should go into that business or not. Mm -hmm. You know, just as an example, I had uh, someone call me to ask me for my advice on this business and she was telling me about it and, and right up, just over the phone, I gave her all kinds of questions. Did you look at this? Did you look at this? Maybe mm -hmm. you should look at this. She goes, are you trying to um, deter me? I said, well, no, but what I want you to do is make an informed decision. Right. If I didn't tell you to look at all these other things and you went ahead and you invested money and you lost, then you could al always come back and say, well, why didn't you tell me? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that everybody looks at all the positive, but also look at everything else right. with, with what's involved. And at the end of the day, you yourself are going to know whether or not you should be investing your money in that business mm -hmm. and whether or not there's a market for your business. Yeah. And then just to add to that, what I would recommend, you know, for anyone wanting to start a business is basically, basically the Gunawaga market's kind of saturated. If you're going to start a business that's just going to target Gunawaga market, it's going to be extremely competitive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one business will, as Barbara mentioned, one business will open, one business will close. We open up a convenience store, another one's going to close because there's only room for so many convenience stores. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're really talking about entrepreneurship is on the innovation. And don't look at the Gunawaga market. Don't even look at the Montreal market. Look at the global market. That's mm -hmm. where all the growth is going to be. I mean, we can, you know... Um, make whatever here in Gunawaga specialty, whether it's moccasins or, or whatever else, and you can sell it to people in Europe now, you know, right. to look at the market from that yes. and, and to see uh, the opportunities that are really out there. You mm -hmm. know, there, there's a plenty of opportunity out there if you look on a, a global or even a regional or national basis, not just a Gunawaga or even just the Montreal area. Look at what your market could be across the globe because it's very easy now to sell products and services all across the world right. to look at that. Great advice. Stephen, in your opinion, what do you think people should train for more in as opposed to uh, the trends over the last couple of years? I know that's the a hard question too. The, but the, the, well, I think from, for parents, I think encourage your kids to get in at an early age, uh, foster them towards, like Kyle said, the STEM, uh, science, technology, education, and math. Engineering. Engineering. Uh, engineering. And, and as well as uh, somehow to develop skills like um, that's the other thing. The, the, the trends are is that you're not going to keep a job very long with this, uh, the, the way the world is changing so fast. People don't keep the same job. Mm -hmm. So you have to develop a set of skills which you, allows you to change from job to job to job. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's problem solving, working with people, team oriented, if you can uh, cultivate those types of skills. And, and, and you know, that's, uh, that would be my advice. 
Okay. Um, any of you have anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye to our audience? No, we're just looking at one another. <laughs> <laughs> anything you feel is important to add or yeah. that the community should know? Uh, just I don't for know, you for, guys. For me, I would just like to, I guess, tell the community that our office is there. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, we have a website, but I would encourage people, if you have questions, you want answers, or if you don't know, want information, come in to see us. We're all there. We have staff that are there and are ready to help. You know, so if it's a simple question or something more, just information about programs and services, mm -hmm. we're all there at everyone's disposal to, to help them, to ensure their success in whatever they want to do, be it, you know, get a job for themselves, start a business, or if they're looking at a potential joint venture for revenue generation, we're there. They pick up the phone, pop in the office, third floor of the uh, business complex. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for staying with us. It was a great interview, you guys. Thanks for coming on. Um, we could have went on and on because economic development in Gunhawage is, is a big venture and it's also, uh, there's a lot of information out there. So if we didn't get to everyone's questions, fear not because um, we will uh, be able to invite uh, anybody back from the Odoni Zakta. And um, as you can see, it was a great interview. So uh, if you have any comments or questions regarding the program, just email us at mohawktv at hotmail.com. And uh, we thank you for staying tuned with us. Ona. Kanya ke haga thadi adrast kayer ni ga hiado zewa de roro.